Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Virtual Breakfast. For those who don't know me, my name is Jenna Thaler, and I am a field crops educator over in the Thumb of Michigan. I would like to introduce Dr. Kurt Steinke, who will be talking to us about soil fertility this morning. All right. Uh, hopefully everybody can hear me all right and see everything okay. Uh, hopefully everybody survived the uh, eclipse okay earlier in the week. I think uh, We'll talk about some basic uh, soil fertility information here this morning, uh, cover a few, I think, observations that we saw this last growing season, and then uh, I think Jeff will give us a reality check on the weather report to bring us back to uh, normal normal uh, weather conditions here. So we'll get going. A couple things I wanted to uh, begin with, you know, I've talked a lot about this, um, this uh, winter already, if you've seen me at any of the winter meetings, uh, fertilizer prices, where they're at, et cetera. So again, they haven't changed a whole lot here uh, heading into spring yet. Um, you know, so a couple things I want to highlight again, our nitrogen prices are down, oh, 20, 21, 22% from where they were about a year ago. Uh, FOSS and potash only down maybe, maybe 10, 12% from where they were about a year or two ago. So again, things have changed a little bit over the last two years, especially with regards to the nitrogen. Um, but again, we're nowhere near back to where we were three, four years ago. The other item uh, to think about here is in that lower right-hand corner, look at that corn price from about a year ago versus today, right? You're looking at 675 February of last year versus about 435, depending on where you look, March of this year. So that really changes your return on investment. So again, sharpen that pencil on that bottom line as we head into uh, the latter part of April here, and we get going on some of uh, those corn acres, especially. One thing I want to talk about is, is you know, that the, the recent winter spring weather volatility that we have, you know, we, I kind of joked the other day, has winter even begun yet? And now it's over. Are there things we should consider or adjust this spring? So one thing I put together here over the last day or two was, you know, it's always good to look at those winter spring uh, uh, precipitation patterns. So, you know, we can remember how wet it was last fall. So you look at October of 23, remember how long it took us to get, uh, especially soybeans out of the field. You can still see those ruts uh, through those fields as we fly over, uh, especially our state here. Uh, so we were at about 4.7 inches last October, well above our 30 year average. November was a little bit under, December was about normal, January was a little bit over, February dried up a little bit. Uh, we had nice warm conditions. Um, you know, a lot of cases we had frost coming out of the ground, I think in South Central Michigan here already, if you even had frost in the ground, uh, probably about the end of January, um, February, we had 70 plus degrees and then March, here we are about 1.8 inches, a little bit under that 30 year average. So, you know, compare that to where we were last year, if you remember, remember we had one of the wettest periods on record up till about April 6th. Last March, depending where you're at in Michigan, we're at four to five inches, tack on another, I think, one and a half to two inches that first week in April. So it was really wet. So we're, we're a little bit different than last year. A um, couple things to, to think about, hopefully, um, on those sulfur responsive crops. Should you reapply based on winter conditions? I'll talk a little bit more about that here over a couple slides. You know, we've had a great late winter, early spring here. So if hopefully you got out any peer uh, uh, K that didn't get applied last autumn was a great opportunity to do so. And as always, make sure you look at that pH and look at some of those lime applications. So I wanted to start off looking at, you know, again, what we went through last growing season. So you can look at that big red circle in the middle of that uh, precipitation chart, right? And there we're looking at from about uh, April 6th to June 30th, we just didn't get much rain last year, right? So that really impacted our wheat yield. But look at leading up to that point in time, it was wet, right? And so that's what I kind of want to hone in on here a little bit. And, th you know, something that really hasn't got much discussion uh, this winter or last fall was that ammonium or soil ammonium and nitrate dynamics last early spring going into summer. Right, and so we do a lot of ammonium nitrate work, looking at how that pattern changes over time. So here's a study uh, that we had uh, looking at uh, basic urea, urea with a nitrification inhibitor, controlled release end product, 
and obviously check plot, no nitrogen applied. And so this corn study got planted May 16th. You can see your uh, initial nitrate and ammonium values down towards the bottom. They're about five parts per million. And you can see how those dynamics shifted over time. You look at the first two columns is about two weeks after application, so that'd be about June 1. That four weeks after would be about mid-June. That six weeks after would be end of June. And that eight weeks after would be about mid-July. So you look at that top line there with urea, you can kind of see how nitrate and ammonium shift over time. Right? That's called that nitrification process. But what really stood out to me was we did not get nitrification to really kick in until about eight weeks after application. All right. Why? We need water for nitrification to take place, right? To shift from uh, ammonium uh, to nitrite and then to nitrate takes water. And we didn't have much of it. Um, and so that was delayed, probably about two to four weeks. So normally, you can look at this uptick that we see over on the right of nitrate. Normally, we would see that closer to probably about that second, third week of June. Again, depending a little bit on when you applied your bulk end application. So that was significantly delayed. You can see where we had the nitrification inhibitor out. It was doing what it was supposed to be doing. Um, where we had that controlled release N out, it was also doing what it was supposed to be doing. But those extremely dry conditions really delayed that overall nitrification process. And, you know, when you look back, we probably lucked out to some extent. Here in Michigan, we started to get those rains again about that, that last couple of days of June, early July, and it takes a little bit to get that nitrification process going. But you look at when that bulk nitrate came on board was right about tassel time, right? And so if we would have had those rains begin, probably another two weeks later, we could have seen a, a catastrophe with regards to the Michigan corn crop because there just would not have been much nitrate there for that plant to uptake. Another thing we saw a lot this last year uh, was sulfur deficiency. So here, if you've never seen sulfur deficiency, here we're looking at sulfur deficiency on wheat. You're going to look at the yellowing towards the top of that plant. It's oftentimes confused with nitrogen uh, deficiency also. But again, it shows up towards the top of that plant. It can show up quite early in the season. So spring of last year, because it was so dry, here's an example, uh, some of our wheat work where we did not have starter fertilizer applied. Looking at a FEEC 7S deficiency, very, very dry spring that we had. Now you go over about uh, 15 feet in this field. And what are we looking at there? You look at that Spartan green, the jalapeno green wheat. That's where we had our starter fertilizer with S applied in the wheat crop this last year. Now, should we expect a response like this on wheat each and every year? Probably not. All right. Um, but again, that's something with, with these variable climate patterns that we, we get into. That's kind of one thing that we've kind of shifted our program is to look at nutrient application, not just from that yield response, but also we need to account for some of the, these variable climate conditions that we now see on a season-to-season uh, -season basis. Uh, one thing I want to talk about here uh, this morning a little bit too is wheat and application timing. Got a lot of questions about that here because spring essentially started about two months ago, right? Uh, so again, remember, soil temperatures really dictate green up. Uh, so again, we were seeing, I think finally, uh, I think Jeff will get into this, some 70 degree soil temperatures in the Southern tier of states here this week and in the, the South Central part of the state, we're just consistently hitting 50 degrees. And so we're really seeing that wheat begin to wake up and start growing. And so it's essentially starting uh, that, that uh, FIGS 4, FIGS 5 growth stage is essentially starting now. One thing we wanted to take a look at and that we have the last couple of years is looking at that freeze up versus green up and application timing, right? That freeze up being that last week or two that the ground is frozen, you can still get across with a bulk spreader versus your more conventional FIGS 5 green up, which tends to be about that first week or two in April. This can influence your other uh, in-season and application timings on our wheat, can impact what you do later in the season also. And it also is impacted by the number of opportunities you tend to see for nitrogen losses, right? So if you weren't well tillered last autumn, I know soybeans came off late. If you got wheat in a little bit late, hopefully you got your N on wheat on uh, a little bit earlier this year. We've had plenty of opportunities to do that. If your wheat was fine going into dormancy, then you could probably hold off till about here this week or moving forward here in April. And so last year, what we looked at for the wheat growing season, we even looked at applying all your N in autumn, 
versus freeze up versus green up ended up being about September 30th versus March 8th versus April 13th. And we looked at this with a late end season application also. So what we see again, that green up application, that conventional FIGS 4, FIGS 5 and application, we saw about a 10 bushel increase over that early March application. And this is two years in a row now. I think the year before we saw about a five bushel bump. Why? Between early March and early April, we saw anywhere between about four and a half to six inches of rain, depending where you're at in the state, right? So again, that's where that initial 10 bushes come from. So you start talking about going up that incremental yield ladder with wheat, five bushels here, 10 bushels here. Pay attention to when you bulk apply uh, your uh, bulk and application on wheat. For 2024, we got the same study out. Do I expect to see the same difference? Probably not, because March hasn't been uh, overly wet, right? I think uh, that the slide I had up earlier, about 1.8, about two inches, we saw in March across much of the state. So I don't expect to see that a whole lot this year. When we apply all of our N in autumn, so again, at planning time, late September, early October, we lost about eight to 18 bushel, depending on where we're at, if you're comparing versus green up or freeze up. Um, when we apply about 40 units of N at FIC 7 in addition, to our early application, we only saw that late end increase that freeze up application, right? And that was about a 10 bushel bump. And so it took about an additional 40 units of N to that freeze up application to bring it equal to that green up end application. With late end FIC 7, in this case, we saw no impact on those green up end applications. And when we applied only 40 units of N at FIC 7, we saw about a 14 bushel bump over our check plot. So when I compare this to about a year earlier, uh, we saw about uh, green up application had a, about a five bushel increase over freeze up. Between those that, that early March and early April in 22, we saw about three inches of rain, saw about a five bushel bump. In 23, we saw about six inches of rain, we saw about a 10 bushel bump, right? And so you kind of use that as a metric uh, to base your N application program for wheat moving forward. One question I've gotten quite a bit this, uh, uh, autumn, winter, and I guess early spring now is about sulfur application time, especially in wheat. Given the conditions that we had, should you reapply uh, any sulfur that maybe you put down in the fall? Uh, maybe it's gone. So we have this autumn versus spring S study that we've looked at a number of years in a row now, looking at at plant versus freeze up. So again, about September 30th versus a March 8th application timing this last year about four different sources. You can see those listed down at the bottom. In 23, didn't see much of a difference with the whole plant FIX5 tissue S testing. Autumn was about 0.26% versus spring about 0.23%. The big difference there is remember about 0.25% is that critical level. So with our autumn, we were above that critical level. With spring, we were a little bit, we were a little bit below that critical level. With regards to the sources, they were all about 0.24 to 0.25%. Lag leaf application, autumn, spring, were both about 0.28%, so not much of a difference there across S sources, 0.27 to 0.28. You can see on the picture on the right where you got S application applied on the left hand of that picture versus no S application on the right. Pretty good color and row closure difference showing up. Overall grain yield, fall versus spring, not much of a difference. But I'm going to caveat that based on that 2023 weather. It was so dry. I don't think we got the best use out of our autumn S application last spring for that wheat crop. So not much of a difference there. But we did see a little bit of an interaction between source and timing. Right? So you can look at this chart going from top to bottom. You got your fall versus spring AMS, fall versus spring ATS fall versus spring gypsum, and fall versus spring mez. And so again, AMS, not much of a difference. ATS, not much of a difference. With gypsum, we did see a little bit of a difference, fall versus spring. See about that 13 bushel difference uh, with gypsum, and with mez, not much of a difference. Now remember, with some of these co-granulated products that have elemental and sulfate sulfur, you should see a better response with fall because you have to get that elemental sulfur to oxidize for that spring summer growing condition, right? Uh, but again, we see a general trend here of that fall outpacing that spring application. So again, something to keep in mind as you start talking about gaining a couple bushel on that wheat yield ladder uh, over, over time. The last thing I wanna talk about here 
today is uh, well, we should have a publication coming out on this here in the next uh, couple of months. Uh, we finished up this last year looking at intensive uh, corn management study, uh, three different states, so Michigan, Indiana, and Kentucky, uh, looking at lots of different inputs and kind of see our control treatment across the top and that control treatment was your basic seeding rate and your basic fertilizer recommendation and only. And then we added two by two fungicide, 20% increase in seeding rate. We added sulfur, we added foliars, we added late season applied in, added a foliar fungicide, and then bottom line there, you see that intensive treatment with all of the above. Now, I'm not gonna get into to, to yield response to each of those treatments, but one thing that really stood out this last growing season, this picture's uh, from a colleague of mine, old student of mine, uh, Dan Quinn from Purdue, he had a couple sites of this. On the left, you see that N only control, no additional inputs applied other than nitrogen. On the right, you see that R2 fungicide application, right? And so there they had significant foliar disease pressure. There they had significant tar spot pressure. So again, you start talking about that stay green potential, getting that plant to stay green longer into the growing season. This can apply to corn. This can apply to soybeans. This can apply to wheat. Um, where does that, that grain yield come from? So we looked at all uh, locations, three different states, and we kind of put this together, looking at where we had fungicide applied versus where we did not have fungicide applied. And just looking at 2023 grain fill duration at this specific location, that R2 fungicide application bought us about another three days of stay green potential. So you might be thinking, so what? What does that mean? What that ended up being is, Look at that milligrams per kernel of corn or milligrams per grain, right? Where we had that fungicide application, we had about 20 milligrams per grain additional compared to where we did not have that fungicide application. I think in 2022, that uh, 20 number was actually 30 or 40 milligrams. So you start thinking, add up 20 milligrams per kernel of corn, count the number of kernels you get on a grain, number or uh, on an ear, number of ears across that field, that's where a lot of that yield potential and where a lot of that yield increase can then come from. So I'll have more to share on this as this year goes forward and probably uh, have something to share with all of you as we go into next uh, growing season or next fall. So with that, I will wrap it up. I'll stop uh, screen share. I will be on for questions later. And uh, I think we'll hand it over to uh, Phil, Jenna, and or Jeff. So if you have any questions, please make sure to drop them into the chat because we are low on questions today, guys. And Phil and I can make up things all day, but we, we would like some good ones from you. So first one we have is, is there a soil temperature associated to when wheat green up occurs and when an application can occur? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, one of the things we, we often get is, uh, you know, a lot of people think applying nitrogen early will get that plant greening up early. And again, it's all dictated by soil temperature. And so typically 50 degrees Fahrenheit consistently is when that plant can then break dormancy and begin uh, putting on new growth. And so, you know, you can look at uh, the weather stations across the state um, and it's not just you get 50, we're good to go, right? It's about that nighttime temperature, how cool uh, we drop down to. Uh, and so as we get into that mid to latter part of April, you'll see those nighttime temperatures tend to stabilize a little bit. And that's when you really get that, that flush of growth. But typically you gotta be above 50 degrees Fahrenheit. And why is that? One, that's when nitrification occurs. Indirectly, that's when that soil biology really starts cranking, right? You get that mineralization of nutrients, you get that activity growing in that root zone. And so that's usually that magic number. And as Jeff said, those sandy soils tend to heat up a little bit earlier. So you could see pockets in your field, right? Those coarse textured pockets start to, uh, uh, get a little hairier earlier in the season than some of those finer textured parts of the field. Um, so again, that soil temperature really dictates it. And you know, if you want a good gauge, look at your yard, right? So you can look at that yard. Everyone thinks if I get the lawn company out there early, I can get the grass growing early and greening up early. That's still dictated by soil temperature too. So those of you that might have a septic system at home, look at the grass above that septic tank and that tends to green up much, much quicker than the rest of your yard why? Because it's warmer, right? And so look at that soil temperature, yeah. base that on that, that green up potential. On the flip side, again, how well tillered were you going into fall, 
right? So that was the number one question this year because wheat got in pretty late. And if you weren't well tillered, fly in a little bit early so that you know it's there so you can get that plant tillered before we get into this uh, flush of growth. Otherwise, it's perfectly fine to hold off to that FIX4, FIX5 growth stage. Thank you. Jeff, the next one is for you. you. You said the current weather system is strengthening. It seems strange that the lower temperatures and movement over land would provide strength to the system. How how can the system strengthen today? It's it's mainly it's some of the things we, we don't see because they're up above the, the surface. And this one, this particular system, and, and one thing I didn't mention, it's it's really more of a late winter type of a of a of a low pressure system than it is in the the spring. If this were six weeks before, we probably would be looking at at least for some parts of the state a big snowstorm uh, because of the path. And it's 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 coming out of the the lower Mississippi Valley up through southeastern Lower Michigan, and for some parts of Michigan, that's a that's a sweet spot of bullseye. Uh, during the winter, it isn't now because there's <laughs> enough warm air, that, which is good. But the real, the real key to this and why it's strengthening, it, it has to do with with lift and other dynamic factors up in the middle and that upper part of the troposphere. And this one has a really strong. It's one of those one of those big troughs that we saw in the the jet stream that's moving, uh, and not not just approaching us, but it's moving and it's it's strengthening as well. So there's a lot of things that come together for these surface systems and and some of them we don't we don't see because they're right not on the surface but this one it will really be noticeable even by later today with the pickup in winds but especially tomorrow perfect jeff we have another one for you how many far how far ahead in days slash weeks uh, are the soil temperatures compared to average did the warm wet winter right. help a, a real good question and it goes back to a lot about what what Kurt discussed a year earlier, and it, this year is just very, very different. Uh, now, there's there's one major caveat here. We start by saying we did have we had the mildest in terms of air temperatures. We had the mildest winter on record here this this past year, and we had uh, some of the the warmest temperatures ever observed in the month of February that occurred also late in the month. That said, though, we did go back to more seasonable weather during March, and it. it so we were way, way ahead, at least in terms of of warmth and of that seasonal warm up that takes place much, much earlier than than normally takes place this year. But it's it's not; it's more subdued now. We're still ahead of normal, significantly ahead of normal in terms of degree days. And now they, they mentioned calendar days. How far ahead are we of normal? Well, if we look at climatology and we look at degree day accumulations probably about a week to week and a half still ahead of where we typically are, but that's that's maybe less than half or even, certainly less than half of where we were just three or four weeks ago. We were way, way ahead uh, earlier, just not as much now. Uh, and th the same would be true for soil temperatures. So, uh, and as we've, we've talked about, there's a lot of dynamics that go on as we look at, of course, planting. Hopefully people really get moving here in the, 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 the next come few weeks, but the soil temperature is also highly dependent on how, on how much moisture is there. So uh, we get an inch and a half of rain here today or over the next 24 hours. That's going to that's gonna slow things <laughs> down for a while, uh, at least to, for a little bit anyway. Yep. All right. The next one goes back to Kurt. Earlier this year, some of us heard a presentation about raising forage grasses. The speaker told us we should put nitrogen on in the fall. Has anybody at actually tested that assertion they have always spring applied and good question so i don't work with forage as much so i don't have much much data on that um you know one thing to keep in mind michigan is not a fall end state um so you start looking at uh, nutrient camps things like that 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 could violate that that would be something to consider the other thing would be are you establishing a forage or grass in the fall or is it just a, a maintenance application right so if you're establishing, that might make sense, help get that that uh, plant a little bit tillered, et cetera. Uh, if it's a maintenance application, you know, there, we just don't have a good judge or read to know what you apply in the fall, how much is going to be around in the springtime, right? Based on a normal winter, whatever you want to consider normal to be nowadays. Now, one of the things to consider with regards to maybe forages would be a potash application, right? So that's one of the the... the the things that really can make that plant green up in springtime um, and look great is K in the fall. You know, so I mess around with all sorts of nutrients. I got stripes in my yard and all 
sort of <laughs> stuff, right? And that, that, that's one of the things, you know, wherever I put potash down in the fall, you can see the to the line where that ends in the springtime. So K is one of the things to really think about with regards to grasses going into fall, going into dormancy, and then greening up in springtime. Perfect. Um, the next one is for you again, Kurt. In 2023 and prior years, you reported a significant response to fall fertilizer by previous crop on wheat. What's happening this year? Yep. So we had a couple studies out uh, this last growing season for the 23 wheat season. Um, we saw, uh, I think, what did we look at? We looked at wheat following silage corn, wheat following soybean. Uh, fantastic yield response with NNS starter following silage corn. Uh, did not see as much of a yield response uh, with NNS following soybean. However, we saw a fantastic straw yield response following both silage corn and soybean with NNS starter uh, on that uh, on that uh, uh, plant. So uh, again, uh, that's one thing we really don't talk about very much is straw production, right? And so you can kind of use some of these inputs to not only promote uh, wheat yield, but you can use them uh, to promote straw yield, and then you can get that additional straw yield to help pay for some of those inputs also. All right, Kurt, next. Kurt, I have a follow up on that question. So, that NNS should that be applied then in the spring? Is that what you're saying, or is that something where a combination of fall and spring? Uh, so for with wheat, uh, if you plant on time, we've seen tremendous responses with NNS starter uh, on wheat in the fall. And so plant on time, you start talking about South Central Michigan, you're talking, you know, September 20th to October 5th, somewhere in that range. In that zone, when we plant wheat later, we do not necessarily see that same response, right? And so again, I think... Uh, Dennis and I were talking about this a couple of weeks back. You know, the idea, if you plant wheat late, the more you have to do to it, you still need a root system to uptake whatever you put down. And we tend to not get that, that root system developed. And so if you plant wheat on time, we see that response with nutrient management in the fall on wheat. When we plant wheat late, like many of us may have done this last year, we tend not to see that response. With regards to starter specifically, again, if you plant on time, we can see that response. If you don't get it on, you can get it on in the springtime, it becomes a little bit of a risk factor, right? So sulfate is an anion and it can leach. Now, is it gonna leach miles and miles down that root zone? We gotta remember, wheat still has a root system, right? Coming into green up, coming into uh, mid-April. So we're not putting a seed in the ground in March. We still have a plant. We still have a developed root system. So some of it becomes a risk factor. There is a risk by putting some of this down in the fall. You can lose some, but if you plant on time, that plant can oftentimes uptake that starter fertilizer in the autumn or in the fall, right? And utilize it and get it in the plant so it's not just in the ground. All right, the next one is gonna go to Jeff. Are you seeing anything in the extended forecast that should give pause to planting plans when soils are dry enough? No, mo most of the long leads are consistent with what, well, and there's one exception. They they certainly are calling for warmer than normal mean temperatures. That's been that's been consistent. That's something we we typically see in these uh, El Nino type uh, type spring conditions. But moisture wise, while the the short term and the medium range suggest the above normal precipitation, some of the longer lead we go out uh, into the next three, four, five week period, we do not see the same risk of of above normal. Uh, precip. So uh, that would be one notable exception. And it certainly is relevant for what we're talking about here with with field work and getting out and uh, and getting moving. So uh, I think the, the bottom line is now collectively looking at those, the delays that we're looking at now are, are mostly short term and, and look for the opportunities to develop over the next week uh, to 10 days as things dry out again. And then we may be moving to a warmer and, and, and possibly a little bit drier type of, of setting. And that, of course, at this time of the year, that that would uh, that would be really beneficial, I think, and hopefully allow a lot to get done. All right. Kurt, how do cover crops affect the soil fertility if you applied fall P and K? Uh, so that one will probably depend a little bit on what type of cover crop you're, you're dealing with here. Are you dealing with, you know, an oat? Are you dealing with 
you know, an oilseed radish. Um, I was dealing with a leguminous crop, etc. Uh, but it's one of those things um, that cover crop can scavenge some of those nutrients in that upper root zone, right? Um, and as that cover crop uh, decomposes or gets terminated, it can give some of that back. Becomes a little bit more of an issue with nitrogen. There's not a one-to-one -one, uh, take up and give back approach, right? So we can mm -hmm. see some end penalty with certain cover crops. Uh, but with P and K, it can scavenge it. It can keep it in that upper root zone. Now keep in mind, uh, as that cover crop decomposes in the field, that P and K is not immediately available to that plant. Uh, but again, from uh, keeping the soil covered, keeping that microbial activity active as long as we can in that field, it, that, that can be a win-win, absolutely. Uh, but it's not an immediate take up P and K, decompose, and give it back immediately. It does have to uh, uh, transition, and there is a little bit of uh, time lapse there. Yep. Uh, do you get much of a yield response in wheat applying sulfur we using thiosol in the spring? Yep, uh, great question. So we've looked at probably, you know, I presented some of those sources today, four or five different sources of sulfur. So thiosulfate can be a great, great sulfur source, right? The key to remember is that um, you start talking about like ATS, KTS, ammonium, thiosulfate, et cetera, does not contain sulfate sulfur, right? Mm -hmm. And so that has to go uh, has to break down to an intermediary compound called tetracyanate, which then can oxidize and become sulfate sulfur. That does not occur immediately, right? So if you're using something like thiosol, probably would depend on when you apply it. If you apply it a little bit, you know, let's say now, you should be just fine, right? Uh, but it is not immediately available. Probably plan on, depending on soil temperatures, that's been the theme of the morning, right? Uh, probably plan on, you know, one to three, one to four weeks to get that thiosulfate uh, uh, transformed to sulfate sulfur. And, you know, there's, that's kind of a big window, but it depends on the environment, right? Um, we've looked at thiosulfate in the fall, thiosulfate in the spring. Compared to not applying sulfur, yes, we still see that sulfur response with thiosulfate. All right. So that is the last question we currently have in. I see we have some of our other specialists on here this morning. Um, Dennis, with wheat growing, do you have any updates you wanted to give us? Yeah, maybe just a couple. Um, in our southern tier counties uh, where wheat was planted on time, uh, that late September, even up to the 3rd of October, we are approaching FIG 6. So that's an important uh, phenological development time. Uh, there are some herbicides that need to be applied by this growth stage, so make sure you look at the weed guide um, that Christy's put out for that. Um, I've also had quite a few growers send me pictures of powdery mildew in their wheat already. So if you are making herbicide applications, um, just get out there and scout your wheat because the susceptible varieties, you may need to put in a, a fungicide in your tank mix uh, when you get out there and do that. But uh, overall, no, things are looking pretty good. Uh, most people are reporting that the stands are looking decent, um, and we've got hopes of even with the warm fall we had, um, you know, the crop was still looking better for even the fields that were planted late. So that's about all I have for now. Perfect. Do any of our other specialists or educators who are on have anything they would like to share? This is Chris Stefanzo. I did get one black cutworm in my trap yesterday, but I only have one trap out right near campus, and there was only one in there. So I don't know what that means. Does it they, mean we should be they, putting they, our, they, our they buckets soon? Yes. If you are, if you trap for black cutworm, they should, the trap should be out. All right. Perfect. Any, anybody else have something for us? All right. Hearing nothing, we're going to go ahead and wrap up virtual breakfast for today. Thank you everybody for attending and we hope to see you next week.